All right, sorry, a little, a couple minutes late there, but I think uh, we'll get off to the races. Here, got a lot of stuff to plug in really quick, and I'm hoping I got it all. But this is live. This is how you do it in real life. So um, keep my fingers crossed a little bit. A lot of, lot of stuff plugging in, a lot of DSP, a lot of stuff running here. So praying for the best. Cool. So um, thanks for sticking around, guys. I know this is the last day of the fest. Hopefully you guys had an awesome, awesome time. I know I have. I haven't hit everything, but I know that... My, so I was here almost for many hours yesterday, and then I got a call to go do a bunch of mastering last night, and that was difficult to say the least. Uh, everything sounded funny to me because I've been listening to speakers all day, and then to go back and listen to my own speakers, everything, I was like, really? That sounds weird. And especially on these, I'm like, am I going to show this tomorrow? Because I don't know. That's a little nervous about that. But uh, anyway, I've had a kick-ass kick, kick -ass time. I hope you guys have too. So um, again, welcome. My name is Jeff Merkel. Um, this is my, I think, third, fourth. This is my fourth fest speaking at it. Uh, I came to it the year before that just as a, as a spectator, and I've had a blast every single time. And I think, you know, a few years ago when I saw this going on, I'm like, I got to be a part of this thing. And so uh, Mar Marjorie was so kind as to let me uh, elbow my way in and give some talks here. So, um, kind of my background is I, 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 uh, I run a recording studio, a mastering studio by day, so called Eight Houses Down. So I have a full like recording. We've been doing that for about 18 years now. So we record bands and, and artists and that kind of stuff for a living. But then I'm and then I've been the mastering engineer for about I've been a mastering full-time mastering engineer for about 15 years. Um, and then that kind of led to uh, I don't know. I saw a physics class that uh, up in C Boulder. I was like, man, this physics class looks so cool. I want to go take this. So I went and talked to the professor. And the professor was like, you know more about this than I do. You should teach this stuff. So I was like, cool. So I started teaching it. Teaching bug bit me, and then I've been teaching uh, teaching physics and recording arts. So now I teach down here at UCD in physics and recording arts. Everyone, when I tell people that, they're like, "Man, that's weird. You live in like physics and recording arts. That seems so different." You're like, "No, actually, it's all physics. I mean, everything is physics, really." But it, it kind of boils down to it's all uh, all physics. And so I come from a, my 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 degrees in biochemistry. So naturally, I went into music. So like that's this is the, so. Um, but I do come from a science background, and I work in the arts, and I really, really, really enjoy this stuff. And so, to me, um, art and science are the same thing. And in fact, I run a group called Signal Noise Media Labs, where our kind of our tagline is the science of art and the art of science. And so, basically, we're taking art and injecting a ton of science and making like making stuff really cool stuff, or we take science and add a lot of art to it. Because in truth, I believe that science is art, and art is science. It's it just happens to be the way you execute it. Programming is art. Uh, it, it, so, and it's me, I'm very passionate about this kind of stuff. So, which led me to um, basically starting my own company. So, I, as a mastering engineer, I wanted a, a huge 7.1 system so I could start doing Blu-ray, but I couldn't afford it at the time. So, it, I was in grad school uh, for, for recording arts, and I was like, well, maybe I should make my thesis loudspeaker design. That way I could kill two birds with one stone, make my own speakers, and get a, and a, get a degree out of it. So, I did that, and I was like, this is awesome. So, now I'm like, well... Why stop there? Let's turn this into a company. And so that's where, I, that's where I've been uh, for the last couple of years. So I kind of you know, dabble in a lot of different things. But one of my, my current company is Merkel Acoustic Research and Design. And what I do is uh, basically apply all the acoustics and stuff that I teach all the time. So, this is, so what I'm showing today, these are a couple of prototypes of some of the speakers that I've been building and working on. These are some older prototypes, but these are the more finished ones. I didn't want you guys looking at NDF today. So I, 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 I gave something that actually has some veneer and stuff like that on it. So. But we'll test them out and see how these things ring out. And so, but the idea is that what we're going to do is, uh, the, 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 the point of this talk, and I'm gonna, we're going to blow through this stuff real quick, is I want to talk about um, just real quick on measurement. So if you, if you happen to have seen my talk last year, it's just, this is going to be very similar to the, the, in, in material, but we're going to start kind of where I left off last year. I'm kind of notorious, well, for speaking fast, but also for trying to stuff way too much information in too much time, in a little time. Um, I don't know, I just, I, the problem is we have to set a foundation to get to the good stuff. And so um, I'm going to kind of blow through some of the measurement stuff this year. We're gonna also, I'll go through and show real quick how to do it. But then I want to spend more time on, tr on analysis and treatment. And th this, this spawns from um, this software that I used. I'm, we're going to demonstrate RumiQ Wizard today. I, I spend a lot of time with it. And I, it's, it's an amazing piece of software. And it, what's even beautiful about it is that it's free. The, the cool thing is because it's free, it ends up in everyone's hands, which is perfect. But the problem is everyone can test and measure, but nobody knows how to, what to do with those numbers once they get them. And I see it time and time and time again on the forums. Cool. This is my first measurement. What does it, what does it mean? And so uh, that's kind of what I want to talk about here is, is, talk, is, is how, what, what do these numbers mean? And why are we even taking these numbers in the first place? Who cares? 
So we'll talk a little bit of analysis, and then and then what, what these numbers mean. How do I apply them? What do I use? What would I use this this information that I'm getting out of this material? So let's dive into it because I want to again I'm going to kind of blow through this stuff pretty quick, and I realize that. If you don't, if you don't pick it all up, uh, you know, round one, that's okay. If you do, if there's something that I, you know, I get my blinders on here, I get speaking fast, get my caffeine going. Um, if there's something that's I'm fundamentally missing or that I make a mistake, please call me out on it. Please, I, like, I want to talk. This is not just a, a, a barrage. I mean, it kind of is a barrage of information. But I also I want you guys to talk to me. So please, if there's something up here, let me know that you want that you want to hear about. So. Um, the, the kind of the thing that I wanted to push for today is, is the idea of taking your own measurements of your own room. The software and the technology is now so accessible that everybody is, has, has the means to do this. And I think everybody should measure their rooms. And the reason being because, I mean, our ears are, I see a lot of, uh, especially at the, at, at the audio file kind of stuff, I, I tend to see a lot of stuff that's on, um, on personal judgment. And I think there's, there's, our ears are beautiful, beautiful, amazing, intricate instruments and, and analyzers. But the problem is that our ears are attached to an emotional analyzer, our brain. So when we, when we, when we listen to something, there's other factors. And I mean, you walk around these rooms, you'll see it, you know, everyone's trying to set moods, trying to do this kind of thing that really sets you, to, to try and set you in a good mood so that you listen to these things and you have a positive experience. A positive experience will make things sound better. And that's true. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a correlation there. But the problem is, again, that what, if you're, say, well, if anybody went to the beer fest this weekend, you wake up, you're really hungover, you may, things may not sound so good to you that day. And then also, but if, you're, if you've had a few drinks, maybe things will sound really good to you. Or there, there's, maybe you just had a really rotten day, things are going to sound bad. So in other words, your, your, your ears are not necessarily, they're a biased tool. They're a biased analyzer. So the things with a microphone, a microphone is not biased. So what you, what, when you turn it on, if the measurement you get one day should be at least relatively close. I mean, factors change, environmental factors, temperature, humidity, all that kind of stuff changes. But if I turn this on and I measure this, take a measurement today, I turn on a measurement tomorrow, it should be exactly the same thing, or at least relatively close, close enough that for, for what we care about. So the idea is that we want to know what's really there. And so by, by tuning your room, it really will bring out the best in your speakers. You go spend a ton of money on these speakers, all the, all the money in the, the, the best speakers in the world are going to sound like junk if they're not in a good room. So, the, so and part of it is I, I want to emphasize that what we deal with when we're talking about like loudspeaker systems or playback systems is that it's not just a speaker. It's a speaker in a room. And it has to be considered as one entire system. And so, so those speakers may sound great in these rooms here, but then you bring it home or, or vice versa. They sound great in the lab or it's great in the, uh, the anechoic chamber. Bring it here, it may not sound so good. So um, we, need it, we want to try and control those, those environmental variables. And so that basically our goal is to try and get a smooth, awesome sounding room that, that you know, that, or at least, or, or in case some, some people here that are uh, recording professionals, something that you, can, you believe is, is, is what you're hearing is the truth. And so um, we, need to, we need to actually dig in and figure out what we're, like, analyze what we're looking at. So let me talk real, 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 just really fast. I'm going to blow through this stuff about the tools to do this. So the first, the first order of business is going to be mics. So when we look at microphones, um, generally, there's a, there's a range of microphones you can use to do this anal analysis with. Running the whole, run the gamut. The first one I have on the list there is this Radio Shack sound level meter. So this is this has been a, a mainstay staple for calibration in the film industry forever. It's a great great little tool. I think actually I don't know my head not better. Oh it does nice. Um, this this little this little device I think goes like fifty or sixty bucks. I think I put it fifty bucks. Although I was on Radio Shack site yesterday to see if they making sure that the price on this looks like they changed the design up a little bit, but it still works. So, and what it has actually has an output on the side of this thing. So it's a great tool just to find out how loud something really is. But then also it has actually it can be used as a microphone, an, an analyzer. So it's 50 bucks, pretty awesome, pretty cool tool. Um, it's an it's a unbalanced output, so I wouldn't use it for anything but maybe this application. Um, then we have the, uh, the Dayton Audio EMM6. Uh, that stands for, I think, electric measurement microphone. I don't know why it's a six. But from... Um, from Parts Express, they're out, they're here. So for six, for fifty bucks, you get a micro a measurement microphone and a calibration file, including shipping. I think too, unbelievably cheap. Amazing, amazing uh, tool. Then uh, the kind of the, the one of the standards has been the Behringer EM or ECM eight thousand for a number of years. It's fifty bucks. Again, you can also get it from Parts Express or Sweetwater or any online retailer. Um, 
It's okay. I had one for a little while, but um, I ended up, well, I ended up pulling the top off it, so I broke it. But it's pretty cool. Then, um, then if you want to start stepping up, we have the Audix TM1 right here, which is, this is, that's what this guy is right here. So it's uh, 300 bucks for this thing. It comes with a calibration file. And then um, if you want to start going, start going up from there, we can go to the Earthworks M, uh, M30 right here. So th this, is the, this is about you know, 650. So this is an uh, Earthworks, great, great, great microphone. So the, the 30 stands, it goes up to 30K. So actually it's a very, 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 very flat microphone. They also have an M50 that goes up to 50 kilohertz. Um, if you decide that you want to really, really, if you want to see if those super tweeters are really doing anything up there, you got you to spend some money. But, uh, um, but uh, yeah, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all my demos today with the, the, the TM1 just because that's my, that's my workhorse microphone. Um, I'll occasionally pull out the other ones just to try them out to see how they're doing, but pretty cool. So what do you get when you go, when you go higher in, in uh, price? Well, um, building a microphone with a little tiny, tiny, eeny, weeny diaphragm is, is a lot of tricky business and making it self, low self noise and super, super linear. Uh, there's, it's, there's a lot of engineering involved there. So um, there, that, that's what you get when you go higher in prices, more linearity. But the cool thing is, even if you go with these lower end ones, you get a calibration file that actually corrects for that, those deficiencies. So if it's not a perfectly linear mic, the calibration file will compensate for that to some extent. So, and, and you, the truth is, I mean, even if you have just kind of any old microphone, I wouldn't say, you know, don't use a, you know, a dynamic singing microphone, like a Shure 57 or something like that, but, I mean, you could try it, but it's not, you're gonna get weird results. So, um, but most of these um, are gonna be, they're, they're condenser microphones, so they're, they have a, they basically work with a, with a capacitor, a capacitance principle. So um, they're very, very, very good at high frequency stuff. So um, that's gonna be the first order of business. I see, uh, you know, like, if you spend time on the RumiQ forums, a lot of people are doing it with this and, and with, with totally good results, but I don't think I would personally do something like that. Um, so the next is gonna be some, so some measurement software. RumiQ Wizard, totally free. It's amazing stuff. So it, it's all Java-based, so it runs Mac, PC, Linux. In fact, I was gonna do the whole demo today in Linux just to see if I could pull it off. Um, but the thing is, there's a, the beta, I'm using the beta version of it, which is, um, it, it's got some cool features that, aren't, that are only available for Windows. So I'm, I'm excited to go with Windows today. Fuzz Measurement Pro, for, for any Mac folks out there, I don't know what it is, because I don't, I, like, I was looking, trying to look it up today, but you can get it from the App Store, but I was working on my computer, which I don't have access to, really. So. Um, if, but Fuzz Measurement Pro is a pretty awesome piece of software. I th does anybody know what it costs? Anybody have it? Okay. I, th I think it's like 40 bucks. It's Mac only. Yeah, it's Mac only. Um, but it's, it's, it's an amazing, it is, it's, I've, seen it, I've seen it in action, but I've never actually played it it's, with it. It's pretty cool. ARDA, so ARDA stands for essentially Audio Real-Time Analyzer. Um, it, it's a really neat piece of software. I actually own ARDA as well. Uh, pretty cool. Smart Live, which is kind of the mainstay for uh, live engineering. Um, it's, been, it's, it's been in live engineering for years and years and years. So when you go to a concert, this is what those engineers, when they have their microphone set up and they're ringing out those huge line arrays and the, all that kind of stuff, that's typically what they're using, used to be. And then if we want to start going really high-end professional stuff, then we jump up to what the uh, Audiomatica Clio system, which is an Italian company. It starts at three grand, but it includes audio hardware too. So, um, but I tell you what, man, RumiQ Wizard, for the money, I, you can't beat it. <laughs> like it really is. It's 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 written by one dude over in the UK, and he's he is. I don't know what. The, to me, the software is. I I would I would pay two grand for the software, and it's free. So I I like it's it's just insane that he supports it and he's he's active on the forums. If you have questions, I mean, it's again I can't I can't stress that. And then the last thing, which I didn't actually put up here, uh, was was you need some sort of interface, some some way to get information to and from your computer. So. You'll, if you spend time on the forums, you'll see a lot of people try and do it with their internal sound cards. I really suggest you don't do that. Get an external sound card. So this is a, a professional recording. So it's by Focusrite. 150 bucks for this guy right here from Sweetwater. So, so in other words, for I guess for under $200, you can get this and a microphone, a $50 microphone, and be off to the races. So $200, and which I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things. You'll start, <laughs> you're gonna start ringing out everything. You're gonna start listening to your car. You're gonna start listening. To, I mean, you, you can do some really fun stuff with this. So anyway, 150 bucks for this guy right here. So it's just a USB based. You can find FireWire ones as well, but it's just it doesn't need to be anything fancy. Um, but it, like you can go over to Guitar Center and pick one up. Uh, that's where I got this for 150 bucks, and uh, like and, and and you're good to go. Of course, you don't have to use Focusrite. You can use all sorts of different brands. Um, like I have an M Audio one right here. Uh, you can get bigger and burlier ones too, but again, for this kind of purpose, small, light, easy to work with, good to go. 
Um, and yeah, go ahead. So what I'm looking at here is from time zero to time five cool. milliseconds, so half a second. And we we're looking at to see what frequencies are hanging out longer. So yes. So like this guy only goes up to 40K, 48K, but this one will go up to 96. So 96, will, this one will be able to do something like that. So this is like an older, older device, but these, these new, the newer devices will easily go up to 96K. This, it's, a, it's called the Focusrite Scarlet uh, 2i2. And, um, and on that note, though, as I'm going along here, please, if you have any questions, I have my contact information up at the end of, this, at the, end of the show here. Just hit me up. I, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about all this kind of stuff. Um, if, there's, if you have any suggestions or, or if, you, if you want any more information about any of this stuff. So I apologize I didn't make a slide for this one. Um, I, I have a real pet. Making slides with a title and, dot, and bullet points is a real pet peeve of mine. And so I can't stand doing them. So I didn't want to keep putting more slides up there than we needed. So uh, yeah, you'll see. So. Um, but again, so that so uh, and then if you really want to take it one more step up above that, then what you can do is you can add uh, a calibration tool. So this is a, a, a measurement mic calibration tool. This is from Tenma, um, like, but there's a, there's another one out there. This is one of the least expensive ones. This is I think a, I think it was like three hundred bucks. It's been a long time since I got this thing. It's a, it's a, basically what it does is it allows you to take calibrated um, SPL measurements. Now, most of the time, what we care about is linearity. We don't care about absolute SPL. We don't care if it's loud or quiet. We care about linearity. So all we really care about is relative measurements, and so we don't really need to have a calibrated SPL. But if you're working, say, in forensics or something where like, uh, you need to have a certain, you need to know um, your, your sensitivity. So in fact, if you want to start measuring your sensitivity of your loudspeakers and that kind of stuff, you need to have a calibrated uh, uh, some sort of calibrated level. And so then what this does is puts out a, a calibrated 94 dB SPL. And you take your microphone, shove it on the front of there, turn it on and say this, and tell your computer, this is 94 dB SPL. And then, then, then you're off to the races there. But you don't really have to have this. This is, this is again, this is just uh, icing on the cake if you're actually doing some of the, those kind of measurements that require known SPL values. Like I said, most of the part, what we care about is relative values. No, I mean, for, for the kind of stuff that we do, I mean, if you're talking like NASA grade stuff where they need like, like I mean, crazy, crazy tolerances, then, then maybe there is, but I would say no. So, um, or I, I'm trying to think of like, I, you know, you always, you always use NASA as kind of the de facto standard for like super high precision stuff, but I can't ever think like, where would you, where would you need like crazy, crazy, crazy high precision uh, SPL measurements, like down to the 10th of a dB, and I don't, I'm like, I, I don't really know when that would be. So let's talk real quick. What are, so what are we looking for when, we, when, we, when we're measuring a room? Like, what do we want to do? We, well, we've got essentially two domains when we talk about sound. We have the time domain and we have the frequency domain. So what we want to talk about is we want, we want very flat frequency response. And that's something that we all kind of just know. Through, like, I mean, you go to any, you look at any audio gear and you look on the back of the box or anything like that, consumer, pro, anything, it's going to ha usually have some sort of frequency curve for you. We talk about microphones, talk about gear. They usually have some sort of frequency response. And that's something that we know pr fairly well. But what we tend to not talk about very much is the time response of things. And so, um, or the temporal response. The, the fancy way of saying it is temporal response. So what we're talking about is the temporal response. So what we want is we want something that, has, that re reacts very well in time. And so something that has uniform decay. In other words, on our reverb time. So when we're talking about just speakers by themselves, we don't want anything like resonating in the box or anything like that. But when we talk about the room speaker system, our rooms resonate too. We don't want our rooms to resonate very long. I mean, we want them to have some sort of liveliness to them, some, some reverb, but not very long. And then we don't want any single frequencies to ring for a very long time. So again, this is, this is the importance of it, because you could have the best speakers in the world, put them in a, in a, in a, in a square box, and they're going to sound bad because the room, not because of the speakers, but because the room is needing tuning. And it's, it, it, it's, it's tough, because you know, we're walking around in the rooms up here, looking at all, all, all the people showing stuff off, and it's, it's a tough, tough battle. You know, you, these are small rooms that we're talking about up here, and there's not much treatment in there. And, Unless you, and, and the problem is also t traveling with acoustic treatment is a pain. It's big and it's light. And it's, sometimes it's fragile, sometimes it's heavy. It's just, it's, not, it's bulky, annoying stuff to work with. And so a lot of times you'll see there's almost no treatment in any of these rooms up there. Or, you know, I mean, and, and I have to give credit to the creativity of what seeing what people are doing up there. I mean, you're seeing like floor mats, you're seeing pillows, you're seeing, I mean, all sorts of stuff stuffed everywhere to try and do some sound treatment in there. But it's, pretty t it's a tough battle, especially if you're not local and you have to travel here with this stuff. So anyway, what we're looking for is we want uniform decay across. We're looking on the, on the order of about 
typically for a normal listening room was around 300 milliseconds, a third of a second about, of, of, of what we'd say reverb time. And now, that's a preferential thing too. I like my rooms a lot more dead than that. My mastering room is really, really, really dead. I like to hear my speakers. I don't like to hear my room. But that's just me. Oops, sorry. Um, so that, that, that tends to be it. So let's actually do some measurements here. So let's get to it here. So what I'm going to do is I'll pull up uh, Room EQ Wizard. Oops, where'd it go? All right. So this is the, your generic interface for Room EQ Wizard. Let me turn this way. So what, are, what I've got here, um, first thing I want to start off is check, check my levels, make sure I'm getting something that's good. Oh, problem with dual screens. All right, so let me disappear. So this is this is the live input. I'm real quiet for a second. I think I'm gonna have this thing cranked. So one of the things that I guess I should also note here, what I, with my setup here. So the way this this the way I have things plugged in is I have this channel, channel one, going to the speaker over here, which is also I have a subwoofer back here as well. So because the speaker, <laughs> I, I, guess I, sh I shouldn't have said that because you guys are gonna be like, wow, he's getting some serious low end off that little guy. But uh, so it goes from out here to my speaker. And then the input one is coming from the microphone here. But the kicker of what we really need to do is, is this loop back right here. So actually I plug the input of channel two to the, out, to the output of channel two. And what that allows you to do is it gives you a reference, a timing reference, so that basically you can compare the input to the output. So it, tells, so it knows how long it takes. Um, so this is again some of the cool stuff you can pull, pull from Room EQ Wizard is that it can give you time, time information, delay information, how far away speakers are. So if you're trying to do like subwoofer alignment or, um, or just even speaker alignment, it can actually do some amazing, amazing uh, tools with that. So um, you'll see that you're like, well, how come there should be no sound playing? But I've got this little ancient computer up here. So this is about a seven-year-old PC. Um, and it's got a pretty junky power supply. That's the cool thing about working on, on laptops is that if I unplug this, we should see that drop pretty close, uh, unless I have the gain just cranked on this thing. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit down there, but minus 90, 90, 85 dBSPO or dBFS, that's pretty, that's pretty far down there. So, okay, so we're getting, we're getting some signal there. Let me just put out some, I'll put some noise so that we can actually see that, get some decent levels going. So let's take, uh, we don't want to do sine wave. We'll do some pink noise. Go about minus six. So I'm gonna, let's, let's, let's do actually a room measurement. So where, one of the questions is where do you put the mic? Well typically you're gonna put the mic at listening position. I'm used to, I'm used to doing, I'm a loudspeaker guy, so I tend, to, I, measure, I tend to measure one meter on axis, although these guys with being a, uh, a MTM, I actually pull back a little bit more. But generally, you want to be on, on axis with the speaker. But for, if you're doing a listening room, you want to put this, put this, typically start at your listening position. But you're going to want to sample all over the room to just get a feel for what's going on inside the room. So we'll back this up quite a bit. Let's, let's, let's get some levels again here, make sure that I'm getting something. All right. Okay. So now we have at least some levels. We can do some measurement here. Brings up my measurement window over here. I'm not going through all the settings on how to do every single thing here. You can mess around with this. Again, it's free. That's the beauty. It's free. One of the things that also you can do with this, which I, I'm just enamored with, is that you can do impedance. So if you want to check your, your, you can do some crossover snooping. You can do some speaker snooping and learn all sorts about stuff that's going inside your boxes here. Uh, with your speakers. But for now, we're going to stick with acoustic measurements. So um, I'm just going to do a one, just do a sweep. Actually, I'll just do two sweeps. You know, it'll average the two of them. OK, I'm on an axis here. It's going to be pretty loud right here. But oh, well. So we heard a little click in there. I'm actually going to do it, run it again. This, this computer is kind of ancient. so. Let's, let's actually, let's nix this, nix this measurement. I'm going to do a new one, because I, I, I would consider that not a good measurement. Got it again. All right, let's just do one, let's do one sweep, see if we can get it in there pretty good. This is, this, is the, this is an artifact of a crappy computer, but again, free soft. It's not the software's fault, it's my computer. <laughs> I 
This is not usually a problem. But you know, we're working, we're doing this. This is real time, real. This is how we do stuff in the real world. So that's that's part of the fun. Can you show us the effect of the click and the measurement? Sure. Let's let's see if it, we'll do it again. Oops. Yes, I know it's good. So let me take one more. See now, now I want to click and I won't do it. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Sorry. We. What you'll see is that. Um, What's interesting with this is just to, to explain what's going on, what that sound is. It's, that's, it's actually creating an impulse. So what we're doing here is we're, we're, st we're taking time and we're sweeping, we're going through a log sweep all the way from like 20, well, I think I said 10 hertz to 20K. And what it's doing is it's uh, sweeping through the frequency, but it knows where it is in time. So it, it measures its amplitude at that particular frequency, and then it does this, 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 this transform and folds everything back to time zero. So if we look at what the actual impulse looks like right here, so we see that there's, this is time zero, and this is our impulse right here. And so we're going to start seeing, this is, for me, I'm, not, I'm, I'm less of a room acoustics guy, I'm more of a loudspeaker guy. So this is very, very noisy and very strange looking to me. But um, we'll see that we have some, actually, like, how can I have stuff, this is, these are in my uh, milliseconds down below here. Like, how can you have something before something happened in time? It doesn't, there wasn't anything in zero, in zero time. But that's uh, uh, an artifact of some of the, room decay and all this stuff. We'll, we'll see you here in just a minute. But the, I, the cool thing with this is instead of doing, we, can, we have the ability to do what's called an RTA, a real-time analysis. So what we can do, and some of the common times, if you go into, say, concerts and stuff, you'll see people do, let's bring back our uh, pink noise generator here for a second. So you can actually go, um, let's bring that a little bit. So we can look at what's going on in real time here. So this is what the speakers are actually, this is what the microphone's picking up. But it doesn't look that good. And this, that, well, right there, I, I'm just doing crude, fast measurements there. But generally, you can just put out noise and listen to the, and listen and, and monitor the input. The problem with that kind of, a, a, of test signal is that it gives you no, no time information. You don't know about anything about the room. It just tells you frequency information. So the cool thing about an impulse, an impulse will give you both frequency and time domain information, which is really important for, and critical for this kind of work. So it, it, we do that, that science way, or that science web uh, measurement signal that we did right there. So now what we've got is, if we look at it, we can look at our SPL, we have our phase. Let's take a look at our SPL. So I'm going to smooth that out, because that's hard, kind of hard to look at. So let's go at 1.6 here, apply selected. All right. So now it looks kind of crazy here. So, and actually to me, this is horrendous. <laughs> and so I wouldn't, uh, like basically we see some decent signal up here. You got a big drop here. You know, we see some wackiness here and then gigantic lows here. So that again, this is the, su this is the subwoofer for being way too loud, disproportionately loud to the, to, the, to the mains. So what I would do is just bring the subwoofer level down. So this is part of one, the first step one. If you happen to run with subwoofers, this is one of the things that you can start off with is go, okay, I can get my, my subwoofers relatively intact to where they need to be to the mains here. Now the mains, you're like, ooh, man. Because I measured this at home last night, and it was dead flat. And so I was doing, but I was under some other, uh, other conditions here. Um, and actually, if we look at this, it starts dropping off fairly dramatically at about 16K. That's because that, that horn tweeter that I have right there, that's about as, this, that, actually, that tweeter that I'm using right there is for PA systems. Um, it's, uh, but I, wanted to ex I was doing some experimenting with horns. And so I, I'd never really played with horns before, so I wanted to mess around with it. But getting, these, these, getting compression drivers to go really, really high and really low at the same time is kind of a tricky business. And so I've since kind of abandoned that idea, although I might be revisiting. But um, and uh, my crossover is actually at around around to 2.1k. I think it's right in here. So so we can see you're like, wow. Well, now, so now what? Or what do, what do we get from this? What do we get from this information? Another thing that we can look at, which is kind of cool, is we can look at our distortion levels. This is something that's really cool that you can actually just take a look at. How how's your how's your speaker performing? So we see that um, this is our, the bl the black line is our THD total harmonic distortion. We see we're getting a spike around here in this, in this kind of crossover region right here, but it's still fairly low. That's still minus 52 below the fundamental, uh, below this level here. So 52 dB below the fundamentals, pretty quiet. So it's pretty, it's pretty far down there. But this is something to, to be concerned about, something to, be, to, to take a look at. They're like, hmm, something weird going on there. 
we are getting some, some distortion as we go lower in frequency there. So kind of cool. That's, this is something that you can only do with the beta version of this thing. Um, and we can look at the impulse, the filtered impulse. Um, we can look at group delay in your system, which is pretty cool. So we're seeing get some, some early group delay in the super low frequencies here. Huh. So that's at, well, that's at 15 hertz. I'm not too worried about that. <laughs> or 13 hertz. I don't care if there's too much group delay at, at uh, 13 hertz. But um, it, you can start to look to see what's going on there. We can look at our reverb time as a function. So we have reverb time as a function of frequency here. We, we can look at our, uh, let's look at our waterfall. This is where things get interesting. So now what we can see is our time information. We see time, frequency, and amplitude. So what we can, we're, what we can pull from this is we can see that this is where you're going to start to look for weirdness in the room. Because when we look at this, this, you're like, well, what's, how much of this is my speaker and how much of this is my room? And it is a little bit tricky to try to discern that. And so you have to spend a fair amount of time with this stuff to figure out which one is your speaker and which one is your room. Um, there's some tricks you can pull to like test your speakers where you do a gated response where it basically listens to only the speaker and not the reverb. And that will give you true speaker response, anechoic speaker response, down to about 200 hertz, depending on uh, a few factors. But, what you're, what, but that will allow you to like rule out, you know, okay, my speakers are really flat. Um, but if they're not flat, or if your room's not flat, what do we do? So this is, this is the, again, one of the big tools that we look at here is our waterfall spritz. So what I'm looking at here is from time zero to time 500 milliseconds, so it's a half a second. And we, we're looking at to see what frequencies are hanging out longer. So frequencies, just like your room resonates, just like a guitar string, or just like an instrument. And that's what we don't want. Exactly what we do want in instruments, we don't want in our rooms. So we see that up here, the high frequencies are dropping off pretty quick, although we see that we have a few, 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 of, these, few of these frequencies hanging out for a little bit longer than they probably should. But below around 300 hertz here, we see some massive, massive buildup down from 20 hertz here. So let's focus on these lower frequencies here for a little bit. And we could see these, fan, these kind of these wing looking things here. And what that tells you is that we've got some frequencies that are hanging out for a really, really long time. And they're, they're resonating. In fact, even when I did the sweep there, I could hear it. Like, are you here? You guys hearing that flutter and some of that? I mean, there's definitely some, some, some big old reflections going on in this room here. So, and the reflections aren't necessarily bad. We just want, that, we just want to tame them. So, um, so what you're looking for is these, these long tails, these, especially these distinct ones right here that are hanging out. So that, what that tells you is that, okay, something weird. Well, first off, just all in general, we've got some low frequency resonances going on in this room. But then you can start going through and, and, tu and tuning uh, to specific resonances if you need to. We can also look at it in, in a different way, spectrogram, which is pretty interesting. So if we look at it here, it's all pretty, it's quite pretty. So we see that, whoa, this frequency right here. So now what we have is time in this axis right here, frequency in this axis, and then intensity of color is the, is the amplitude. So if we look again, look at these lower, uh, high frequencies, they're all decaying fairly uniformly. We've got a, a something dropping out at around 600. It, it tends to drop off quickly at 600 here, something new to think about. But at these really low frequencies, say below 100 hertz, but also, again, my subwoofer is cranking. So my subwoofer is disproportionately loud. If it was, wasn't such a pain, I would turn my subwoofer down and do another run. But um, just as a side note, so all my, stuff is, all, my, all my stuff is DSP controlled. So I have to go in, plug in the USB, and pull up the interface and reprogram my subs and all that stuff. They don't just have volume knobs on them. So it's kind of a pain. <laughs> and so, um, so, but we see that this frequency right here in particular, 60 hertz, around 60 hertz is just hanging out forever, like a, a whole second. That's really crazy. So this, this will tell you what, where to start looking at things. But again, that still doesn't tell you much information. That just tells you that there's something wrong there. So we need to figure out what, we, what can we do with this information. So, um, so my goal, so the next step, what a lot of people do, and the name of the software is a little bit deceiving. It's called Room EQ Wizard, right? It tells you, oh, well, then that means I should start applying EQ. And that, that, that's certainly maybe a possibility. But the problem is EQ is not going to, EQ doesn't fix like hanging on re resonances. All they're going to do is maybe fill in the, the linearity to give you a smooth frequency response, but it does nothing for the actual amplitude or for the, the, the frequencies in your room. And that's a problem. So all the EQ in the world will do you no good. I mean, and, and to be honest, especially a show like this, you walk around, EQ is fairly taboo, you know, to throw something in line between your, 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 pro, your I guess, your DAC to your speakers 
to throw another processor in there? Eh, I don't know if you want to do that. So, that, um, I mean, some people are really into that. Some people are really against that. It's up to you. Uh, I, have, I have some EQ built into my speakers. So I have, I have computers built in, into my speakers. And they're all self-amped. So they're actually DSP controlled and self-amped. And so I can, I can do the EQ inside the box here if I need to. But again, that doesn't, that doesn't help us with, with room work, or with, with our room. So um, there's a lot, 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 lot more that this software can do. But I just wanted to just show you, take a couple quick quick measurements and take a look at what we can derive from this stuff. The interface is great. Again, it runs on anything. The one thing I will say, if you're Mac-based and you decide to use this, that you, um, you can only use uh, two-channel interfaces. Uh, Oracle and Apple don't, well, Apple and a lot of companies don't get along. But Oracle and Apple don't really get along too well. And basically, there's a, there's a, a problem with Java and some of these sound card things where uh, it, it's, it's on Apple's end that basically they won't allow you if you want to do measurements you can it, the, the interfaces don't show up in the software because it's java based with um, unless you only have a, a two channel interface so this is like two ins two outs whereas this one right here has two ins and four outs so this one would not work on a mac but uh it will work fine on pcs or linux based stuff too so uh, just a heads up, because I see people, I, I, like I, I, I'm a big evangelist of this software, and everyone goes out and starts trying it, and they're like, my, my stuff doesn't work. It doesn't show up right. And so that's because you don't have, or Mac doesn't agree with that. that. That said, I also will say that you can use your internal sound card on your computer. It just makes for kind of, you have to use a lot of adapters, because this feedback loop thing, so I have the output plugged to the input. That's, not, that's kind of tricky business. That's harder to do with an internal sound card. And also with the internal sound cards, you don't have preamps, and you don't have phantom power and all this kind of stuff for these microphones. So again, I'm, I, I'm a big proponent of the USB card, but you know, there's, there's, people do it successfully using the internal cards on their, sound, on their, on their machines. But there's, it's just, I, I just don't think it's a very good idea. OK, so the point is now, so now what I want to do is go, OK, so now we need to, we've got some information here. We need to start treating our room. We need to do something about this. So we'll, we'll just, for, for example, say that my, our, our room is, our, that our speakers were flat. I would, if I were to go through and, and do this, I would spend more time flattening it out with EQ. So it's a combination of EQ and room tuning that you're going to be, that I would be doing. But I, so I would go through into my speakers and start getting my levels. My subs are way hot or hotter than my mains right now. Um, so I would go through and, and, and tweak those to get those a little bit more in line. But if you're dealing with a full-range system, of course, you don't have that option right there. But uh, I decided to go to a, a satellite subsystem because my master room is a little bit small, and also I'm putting a 7.1. I have some Dunlevy SC4As, which are my big guys, and getting seven of those in this little tiny room, that, well, I can't afford it, but it also doesn't make sense. So, um, so I'm going to a more of a subwoofer satellite system. Uh, so I would spend a fair amount of time with that. But then, then now we go, OK, now how do we actually start working with this information? What do we do with it? So let's go back here. So let's talk about some treatment. How do we start treating our room, or in other words, to be more specific, how do we tune our room? And, and what do we do? So there's going to be essentially three factors we're going to talk about. The first one, we're going to talk about diffusion. Then we're going to talk about absor absorption. And then we're going to talk about low frequencies. And low frequencies are kind of they're a different beast altogether. And so I'm, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about low frequencies last, but that's the, kind of the, the cool stuff. Because that's the, that's the real problem that we saw that we're dealing with there. So I'm going to kind of blast through this here real quick, just because this is, this is important information. But I want to get to, the, get to the, the end stuff here. So when we talk about. What I want to do is talk about this idea of diffusion. So when we talk about sound in a room, so sound is energy. Um, we could go through and do, go through with all the physics and, 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 and prove it to you, but we'll just say it for now that sound is an energy. So when, I, when, when, we're, when I'm speaking here, both acoustically out of my voice and also through out of the PA system here, we're filling the room with sound. I fill the room with sound, and then when I stop, it takes time for that sound, that sound to go away. Now sometimes, and that's what we, the, the, the effect of that is what we call reverb. So if we want to hear what the reverb is, we want to, if, if we had it completely dead in here, it's, it would say, you would barely be able to hear me. So we need, we like to have that, that room. We like that sense of space. I mean, like I said, I, I tend to prefer more dead, but we like the, the sound of energy in a room. And so when you walk around in these, ro these rooms, you're hearing a lot of awesome sound. And that, the sound fills the room. It sounds great. But at the same, so a lot of times we want, we want the sound to stay in the room. But we don't want it to reflect back and forth in parallel walls in, in this kind of business. So what we want to do is we need to break up the, we want that sound to, to the energy to, to remain in the room, but break it apart and spread it about evenly. So the, the, the first trick is using diffusion. So how do we do that? Well, I mean, sound, um, we'll talk a little bit about waves. But 
I mean, something, and you, I've seen some creative stuff up, upstairs too. Some people are bringing some pretty neat stuff. So you use something like this. This is an Orlex, like basic, I think they call it the mini fuser. It's something we used to use on one of our back walls. You just attach these to the walls or the ceiling. And when you think about it, if a sound hits it, the sound breaks apart and it goes in different directions. So, uh, so a sound that comes on here will go in this direction. Some of the sound here that will go, it will spread out an array in this direction and also on the side, it actually has a profile to it too here. So the problem with this though, and then th this is all well and fine and that works really fairly effectively, but we have to think about, we have to go back to the, this idea of wavelength. Oh, actually, I have to show you an example. This is pretty cool. So this is Blackbird Studios. This is George Massenburg studio. Uh, I think it's in Nashville. Does anybody remember where it is? It's in Nashville. So this is like an extreme version of diffusion right here. And what, the, what, what you go in here, and the idea is that you keep the energy in the room, but it breaks it apart so you don't even hear the walls. You, you, hear no ref, you, he, you don't hear reflections. You hear energy, but no reflections. So this is uh, MDF right here, and I remember seeing some of the construction photos for this thing. It's, this room, I mean, I don't know how far deep these go, but this room is heavy, <laughs> really, really heavy. And the math that goes in behind this, so this is all mathematically figured out, is just mind-boggling. I don't know how they pulled something like that off together. I would hate to be the person that walked by it and broke a couple off or something like that. It would suck so bad. But I mean, I've, I've, read, I've read people's experience, of course. If, if you know who George Massenburg is, he also makes some hardware. This is all his hardware, too. Um, but uh, um, I've, I've only read of people's experiences in there and heard that's just amazingly so amazing sounding in there. Um, but the idea is that when a sound hits this, that it's going to have different reflection points and it's going to spread out. And so that it's going to have different reflection at different points and it, it breaks it apart and spreads it out all over the place. But of course, most of us can't live in, you know, don't have access to something like this. If you do, you're, you're, I want to hang out with you. But like, uh, this, this, most of us have to you know, deal with uh, multi-use rooms or you know, budget constraints. So um, this is, uh, so, so examples would be something like this. Um, you see some other, some other ones right here. So this is like, I guess, I, I, don't, I don't quite understand this. I, just, I literally pulled this off Google Images this morning. I was like, look, and I'm just interesting. So what we see here is we have a, we have a textured wall right here. And it, the idea, I mean, I, I don't understand it because this, the couch is between the speakers, which is strange to me. I don't know what this is, but cool looking wall. So, um, so the idea is that the sound hits this and it's supposed to break up the sound. And, and it's supposed to send different sounds and rays scattering in different directions. And, and in, uh, in at first glance, you're like, okay, that kind of makes intuitive sense. I, I, I get that. But there's something fundamental that's, that we're kind of missing with a lot of this, this, this diffusion. And that, that we, have to, we have to go back and we have to consider this, this idea of wavelength. For any of my students in here or people that have seen me talk before, I use this slide a lot. This V equals F times lambda. This is kind of my mantra. So V equals F times lambda. It's not a Bell wave equation, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an equation that does describe waves. So what we, do, what we look at this is velocity equals frequency times, times wavelength. So in the case when we're talking about sound, V is, is the, spe, uh, the speed of sound in air, which is 343 meters per second. I, I, I only work in the metric system. Um, there's only three countries on the planet that are not metric. Anybody know what they are? Burma. Burma, yes. Wow, you're the first person I've ever met that actually got that. <laughs> yes. Um, anybody, uh, how, what about the other one? Anybody? What was it? No, I'm, I'm Brayton partner on it too. So I'm like, I'm hoping somebody gets it because I'm like, I can't remember myself. <laughs> it's a, it's a sm super small African country that was uh, former US slaves that returned back to Africa. And so they dragged, Liberia, yes, that dragged our, our imperial system. Back. Even, even England, who, is, you know, we call it the imperial system, doesn't even use it anymore. Although they, you know, it's, it's, it's trickled about in, in, in the UK, but for the most part, every, everybody but us. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a diehard proponent of, of switching to everything in the metric system. But the idea is that we have V equals 343 meters per second. Now, of course, we tend to use these very algebraic variations of it more, but V equals F times lambda is, is pretty easy to remember. Velocity equals frequency times the wavelength of a wave. So if we want to find out what the frequency of something is, find out the V. And, we, and we, if we know the wavelength. So V is almost 340, not always 343 meters per second. It changes on, on environmental variables. But 343 meters per second. So um, does anybody know, did uh, um, Baumgartner, did he, did he did, I saw him jump. But did, he make the, did he break the sound barrier? The guy, the guy that jumped out of the skydiving t today? He did break it? Cool. Fastest, man, fastest human being alive. Well, as far as like, 
I guess I say gravitationally, <laughs> but like, uh, broke the sound barrier today. So he went faster than 343 meters per second by jump, just jumping. And so um, pretty awesome stuff. I saw the fall. It was pretty cool. But they didn't know about the speed. So if we know the wavelength, we know frequency. And if we know, if we want, if we know the frequency, we can find out what the wavelength is. But the thing that I want to look at right here is the proportionality of this. So we have a, it's in the, oh, crap. I totally blew that, didn't I? <laughs> I, can't, I can't leave that up there. Did you guys see what I did wrong? Anybody see it? This F, this F is, this is, V is supposed to be above, over F. <laughs> That's big no-no. I can't leave that up there. Um, part of the, what I'm doing is, I mean, this is LibreOffice. Um, this semester I decided uh, I was going to try and do everything open source as much as possible just to see if I could do it. I don't know, stupid challenge, but I thought I would try and do it. And LibreOffice is an amazing piece of software, but it certainly doesn't like your, it doesn't translate well with Microsoft, and I fight a lot of things with it. Pretty cool, though. Free. Again, so I'm like, you see, there's a trend. I like free stuff, right? <laughs> so um, lambda equals V over F. So if wavelength goes up, so this is in the denominator. If wavelength gets bigger, what happens to my frequency? Goes down, right? So if, if, if this goes up, this goes down. Kind of hard to see it there, but the same, and, but conversely, if my frequency goes, if my wavelength goes down, my frequency goes up. So what we see is that long wavelengths are low frequencies. Uh, short wavelengths are high frequencies. So that's what we, that's what, that, that, that's what we care about right there. So, and the, the reason is that we're go, where I'm going with this is that it's important when we talk about, in terms of diffusion, the si size matters. So, um, so when we talk about what a wavelength is, it's how long it takes to go through one entire cycle. So what, we, what we're showing here is a compression wave and a rarefaction wave. It's very difficult for us to describe how sound wave works with just pictures. Even pictures here don't really do much justice because this isn't really what's going on with sound. Sound is compressing up and it's stretching apart. This is just kind of an abstract representation of what's going on there. But it's, the, it's how long wavelength is. So what I want to do is just, um, take, just do a quick example here. What's the wavelength of a 1,000 hertz wave of sound and air? So using our, our, our fancy new equation, V equals F times lambda, I always start with this one because I can remember it. And then I do, I do algebra, algebra change. Uh, wavelength equals lambda, or v, v over F, 343 meters per second divided by 1,000 hertz. So it's 0.343 meters or 34.3 centimeters, about this big. So it pays to think about this. So I think, I think, about, I think about wavelength all the time. When I talk about frequency, anytime I talk about frequency, I mentally pull up, I conjure up a, an image on what the wavelength is. Because how that, what that wavelength does, especially in, in environmental conditions, is, is, is huge. So if, I, if, so if we're looking at this one right here, 34.3 centimeters, and I take a look at this diffuser right here, that's about that length, you know, plus or minus. We're, we're in the same scale. So if I say it's 34.3 centimeters, yes, that's about, you know, 34.3 centimeters. That's in that range right there, which means this is going to be very effective at, 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 uh, at 1,000 hertz. But if I were to talk about, say, um, do I have some other examples here? Let's look at a few other wavelengths here. Lowest frequency we can hear, 17 meters, 17.2 meters. Is that big or small? I guess relative to what? I mean, big big is a relative term, right? It's, it's small, small compared to a blue whale, or a blue whale, but or the Empire State Building, but it's big compared to you. And so, 17.2 meters. And if I go on the other, whoops, on the other extreme, 20,000, the highest frequency you can hear, 1.72 centimeters, tiny. That's little. That's little compared to me. And I'll fill in just the, some some uh, j just a couple other ranges right there. 2,000 hertz is about 17 centimeters, and 200 hertz is about 1.72 meters. So. The idea, though, is if we look at this, these values right here, that, that those values, so if I were talking about 20 hertz right here, 17, a 17-meter 17 wave, so this compared to a 17-meter wave is nothing. So if I have a whole wall littered with these things, and a 17-meter wave comes along and, and, and it smashes against this wall, these do nothing. They don't, they're not effective at that wavelength because the wavelength is so gigantic compared to that. And if we talk about it, actually, it probably still will be effective at, at uh, at 20,000 hertz. If this, this slope, if we're talking super small here, now the slope is, is, is gigantic compared to that little tiny wavelength. It's not going to be effective. So the idea is that if you, your, your, your strategic approach to this is you need to have a range of different strategies to deal with multiple different wavelengths. You can't just throw up one thing and call it good. You have to, you have to, to build this into your entire system.
So again, size is really important when you're talking about the scale of stuff. And if we want to get more scientific, that's when we start down the road talking about diffraction. So how diffraction, how, things, how sound wraps around and interacts with objects, passes through objects, and, and so on and so forth. But that, that, if, if you happen to catch my talk a couple years ago, it was called diffraction is everything. To me, I, 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 diffraction is, I think about diffraction all the time. So when I, when, I hear, when, I, when I see sound in my mind's eye, I think about sound moving around in air and how it flows. But you have to think about wavelength. And so it's, it pays to go through and do a few exercises on that V equals FM lambda. Just get a feel for it. Like, well, if I'm talking about 1,000 hertz or 2,000 hertz or 10,000 hertz, what are we talking about in terms of wavelength? And so, so if, I wanted, if I want to treat a room that's going to have some, effective, some so effectively going to work at these lower, wave, lower frequencies, it's going to have diffraction. Now, for small room acoustics, that's not very big. You don't, you, don't, you don't want to do that. But if you're talking about concert halls or stadiums or that kind of stuff, and you want to actually diffuse sound around, you'll see above like stages uh, at performance halls, you'll see gigantic, huge curvature of uh, things. And in that case, they will diffuse the sound very, very effectively. They'll pass it out, and they'll spread it around. Um, OK. So let's. Uh, so the, the, the bottom line here, though, is that I really want you, oh, so then, so that's, this is just, these are, these are um, some kind of, what we, I, would, I would consider these more brute force. So you can, and of course, we can, we can be, just throw these up on a wall and call them good. You'll see some stuff, you'll see examples of them up in the rooms around here. You'll see all sorts of different kind of diffusion techniques. Um, but again, they work well at those upper, you have to think about the wavelength for them to be effective. But there's some other, there's other ones, there's more, little more sophisticated ones. And, so we can just throw stuff randomly up and try to break up waves. Something like bookshelves. Bookshelves work pretty well. One of my first mastering rooms was in my basement, and I had a bookshelf behind me, and it worked fantastic. And it was there was no rhyme or reason to it. I just had a bunch of books and objects and all that kind of stuff all over it, and it worked really well. It actually broke up the sound fairly effectively. I could feel that there was energy in the room, but I didn't feel like it was reflecting off the back wall. It just kind of enveloped me and spread around the room. It was really cool. But we can get more sophisticated with this and looking at that Blackbird Studios, or if we look at something like some of these ones here, we start talking about um, the, these, these kind of uh, diffusers. So where they're working on more, they're, you're actually using the air to do some pretty cool stuff. So this is, um, this is designed by Doug Greenlee over here from Sound Kinetic. And um, can, I say, can I announce that? It's, well, I already am. I'm going to announce it. This is like an open source idea that you can, you can actually go through and make these yourself. I mean, you have to have the fabrication methods to do it. But, um, a lot of these, a lot of these um, techniques are proprietary, like RPG and some of these other ones. They're, they're copyrighted and, and patented on how these, these, these functions work. But um, Doug has been gracious enough to uh, donate this one to the world. Again, go open source. Not on, I'm not, when I say go open source, I'm not open source on everything, but <laughs> on some stuff I am. And, um, but anyway, this is Doug's design here. And um, you put this on my wall. Yeah. For, uh, for this guy? I don't know. Sound, you, would you, did you post these? I'm a fabricator, so I'll put it up. Can I put it up? Yeah. Okay, I'll put it up. So MerkleAcoustics.com. Um, I'll, uh, I'll put the measurements up there. So I'm a SolidWorks guy. I'll put a SolidWorks model, model up there, but I'll put some CAD files up there so you can look at them. The, my site got hacked this last week, so it's just a splash page right now. Um, so yeah, so there's not much on my set right now, but expect that in the next few weeks. Um, I'm getting it back up and running, so my apologies on that. So this, that, that I put up a new website this morning um, before I got here, so because I was like, I gotta get this done. But I'll put this, I'll put the design up, some CAD files on it. But can I ask you to do a little write-up on it to explain how it works? That'd be cool, because I think that'd, that'd be neat to explain how this stuff works. So basically what this does, you put this against the wall, uh, okay. would you say half inch? Quarter inch away from the wall, and it does some pretty, pretty neat stuff. So, the idea though is that that all all diffusers are not created equal. How, what's the range at this effective uh, effective? Six hundred hertz up to. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, which is you know that's the money range I guess I would call it for for most of our listening environments, our music. How are we doing on time? Okay, gotta move fast here. So the other thing is we want to talk about this idea of absorption. So. If you want to take the sound out of the room, so you want to remove energy from the room. So again, once again, sound is energy. But uh, I don't know, some of you guys probably remember this campaign. So this is, of course, a false. This, this is not how sound works, thank goodness. <laughs> so um, it's, it's important to realize that the way, when you start think about how, you, do, you know, it's easy to go out and buy some, some foam or some absorption materials, but without a real appreciation for what's actually going on with the physics. And so it, 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 again, it pays to help to understand what's going on with the underlying physics behind this sort of stuff. So what is sound? Well, sound is energy. Sound is a wave. And I, I have all these animations and that kind of stuff, but I don't really have time for it right now. 
Sound is a, sound is a wave. It's, it's energy passing through a medium. But it's interesting to note that the wave moves, but the energy, the medium does not. So this is, that's why this is wrong here. This is like if you're standing in front of a speaker and getting blasted by sound, it's not like standing, it's not windy, right? So the waves pass through you, but the air itself is actually just vibrating. It's moving back, the air moves back and forth, but the wave propagates through the medium, air being the medium. So we think about what sound really is. Sound is just air vibrating back and forth. It's a bunch of little air molecules that squish and pull, squish and pull, squish and pull. So if we want to, do, and so that's that, that's that energy in that system, is that vibrate, those vibrating molecules. So if we want to damp that system, if we want to remove that energy, how do we do that? Well, we want to slow those molecules down. So what we're going to do is we're going to add friction. So um, most sound absorbing is going to be done by adding friction to this moving air. So, what we, so this is why we start, um, so like semi-porous materials slow the air down. So when we deal like this, but again, this is another one of Doug's uh, creations right here. Um, we have some fiberglass boards here, and you'll see these all through the, the show. People put these up, and so fiberglass is really good at allowing some air through, but not all. And so when the air, the air, moving air, gets into here, the fibers of the fiberglass slow it down and cause friction. So then that energy, that sound energy, is actually lost to heat. So these panels do heat up. When I say that, it's like you'd never know. I think. Isn't it like a million people screaming to heat up a cup of tea or something like that? That's how much, how much sound energy there really is. So it's not like, you're it's not like by having your speakers crank, you're going to heat up your walls or anything like that. But, um, but the idea is that this, this energy, is, you're slowing the energy down. So there, there's a limit. So if I, make this, 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 if, I, so if I make this too dense, all of a sudden it doesn't work as well because it does, it, the sound reflects off of it instead of actually getting into there. If I make it too loose, it doesn't slow the molecules down. So fiberglass tends to work really well at this sort of thing at sound damping. Um, I tend to use more of these, this material here. This is, this, oops, this, is recycled this is recycled cotton. This is, this is old blue jeans. So this is by a company called Bonded Logic. Um, so this is actually what I use in my speaker, inside my speakers for my damping materials. So this is, uh, this is, uh, it, it, I like this because, well, you see it's like a little dusty, but it's, uh, it's, I don't have to wear a mask and I don't get itchy or anything like that. Um, so this is really, really cool stuff. You can get it from like, you just have to look it up like for distributors, but it's, it's, it's about twice as expensive as fiberglass, not the boards, but just like you know, R13 Home Depot style stuff, uh, which I mean, if you're just trying to treat your room and you've got some, like, um, I'll go buy, I, I use this a lot too. Just go buy some uh, fiberglass at Home Depot and some burlap at Joanne Fabric. You can get 40% off coupons. Get some burlap here. Again, I'm kind of an eco guy, so burlap is jute, and so this is a natural product. Put it up, and it sounds great. So, but again, once again, you have to think in terms of wavelength here. So it says most effective at one quarter of a wavelength. I'm not going to go into too, de too deep on this stuff, but we talk about sound reflecting in rooms. When we talk about the wavelength, so again, you have to think about how well this stuff works. Where the air is moving the most is where it's going to be the most effective. So the most convenient for us thing to do is to throw it up on against the walls here. But that's not necessarily where the air is moving the most. It's at high frequencies, when I say high frequencies, I mean short wavelengths. Short wavelengths get into this thing, and, it, it, and anything that's greater than a quarter wavelength long, wide, it's going to absorb it pretty well. But as we start to get to lower, longer wavelengths, this becomes less and less and less effective against the wall here because this is actually what we call a velocity uh, node. Um, when we talk about sound, as the sound reflects off of here, the velocity moves out here. So in fact, the best place to put this in a, in a room would be in the middle of the room. But that's a bad idea, right? I mean, we want to be in the middle of the room. So like, that doesn't work too well. So this is why um, putting th these absorbers tend to work really well on the wall at high frequencies, but very poorly at low frequencies. All right, so I'm going to get, so um, there's a lot of different other, so open cell foam is another co a common one. Open cell foam works really well too. So I get, you know, a lot of people that are DIYing this stuff, they'll come across a bunch of foam from packing foam from uh, some, some, I don't know, actually Danny, yeah, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you, had, you stumbled upon a bunch of foam. And so closed cell foam doesn't work. Open cell foam does because you need to let the air through there. Closed cell foam means all the little tiny, the, the, inside the foam means they're closed and they, they don't let air through. You need to have it open so that the air can actually get through there. Is it called bonded logic? Bonded logic, yeah. It's called, um, bonded logic, this is called Ultra Touch is the product, and the company's called Bonded Logic. They also make acoustic specific colors and stuff like that too, so you can actually buy it. I've never been able to get my hands on the panels, but um, I think they're, I don't know, somewhere out east. So let's talk about low frequencies in room, like for five seconds, and then we can get out of here. 
So when we talk, talk about well, the reason low frequencies are a different beast, because we have to talk about this notion of standing waves. So standing waves are, when we talk about high frequencies, a high frequency, a short wavelength, will hit a wall, reflect, and bounce all over the place. And in fact, if we're not careful, we get flutter echo like this when we get parallel walls. So flutter echo is bad. I mean, are you guys hearing the So that's because the, the, this little tiny, this impulse is traveling back and forth and back and forth there. So that's where diffusion would be really helpful. It'll actually break it up. So we can get that sound energy to move around, but actually not, not resonate like that. But when we start getting really, really long wavelengths or lower frequencies, we get, we get a feedback system in our, in our room. And our rooms actually start to create, a re start to resonate. And so that's what a standing wave is. So why are standing waves bad? It creates inconsistency. So I, I did a little bit of a talk on this last year. And it's, it's, this is one of the things, again, with Rumi Q Wizard and, and a little bit of math, you can do some really fun stuff. You can get the subwoofer cranking here, find out what the re resonance of your room is, and walk around. And you can hear it get super loud and super quiet at different places in the room. Or what this actually says to me is when, when looking at that Rumi Q wizard data, you see a really long resonance there. You're like, ah, I see I have, my room is resonating. Uh, this, is, this is sitting in, a, in a, what we call an antinode, a, a loud spot for that one frequency. And I can work it backwards and go, let me find out, let me hunt this thing down and find out what room mode we're working in here. So the trick, though, with this is that, once again, how do we treat these low frequencies? So, when we look at this, and again, oops, I even lost, this, lost one on the bottom there. This is, again, an artifact of me train, trying to change different platforms, is that we can look at things in terms of pressure or velocity. And so if we look at our first mode, we look at it in terms of pressure, we, tend, we hear in terms of pressure. Our eardrums move in and our eardrums move out based off of how hard the air pressure is pulling or pushing. A rarefaction pulls on our ear, a compression pushes on our eardrum. So what we want to do is that we hear like this, but we actually we work, we absorb sound using this. So this is the problem. So if you, if you walk around, if I, if I start to bump some tunes in here, in fact, we have a lot of time to sit in the show. If you walk around, you will have this experience. You go near a wall, it gets really bassy. So it sounds like it gets really, really bassy. And that's because if you look at this right here, we call this antenna. It's got a maximum at the walls here. So we, 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 and so I guess intuition tells us, well, then if I've got this, that's where I should put this, right? I should put this against the wall because that's where it gets the loudest. But you have to, we, have to, we have to think about this for a second. What we're, what we're doing is we need to slow the air down. Pressure and velocity are not inverses of one another, but they're, we're, we're at a minimum, at a pressure minimum at the walls. I'm sorry, pressure maximum, but a velocity minimum. So for us to treat low frequencies, we have to come up with a different strategy. Um, this is just, uh, what do I have going on here? Oh. We can go through, you can figure out what, what standing waves and wavelengths and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to figure out the fundamental mode of oscillation of your room, go through and uh, you, can, you can figure this stuff out. So I think this is actually this room right here and this axis right here. So this, this, mo this room is nine meters wide, is that right? Yeah, that's about right. That this room resonates at 19.1 hertz. It's fundamental in this axis. Is that a problem? Probably not, we don't care. I mean, it probably resonates at 19 hertz, but I can't hear it, so I don't care. You know, an elephant might go, oh, man, that 19 hertz sucks. But we can't tell. We can't hear that low. So it's not a big deal to us. But we can hear the harmonics. So if we call that 20 hertz, we can hear 20 hertz. We hear 40 hertz. We hear 60 hertz. Now we're in our range. So if we go back to our, let's take a look at this for a second. Ah, wait a minute. There's a 60 hertz resonance right there. Aha. And we happen, and I'm dead center in the room right here, which if we go back to our slide for a second. Ah, oh, really? <laughs> Come on. That if, oops. If I look at this right here, um, our third mode of oscillation is 60 hertz. We're at an anti note at a pressure, or a vol uh, sorry, shoot. Maybe I'm wrong there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're at an ant. No, actually, I, I might be wrong there. So I'm going to have to do some sleuthing. So this is, actually, this is a head scratcher. It's not, it's not something you just whip out. I, I, I've done this analysis a few times on different rooms. And you have to go through and figure out these low frequencies where they are. It, it gets tricky. It's tricky. And to be even more complex, I'm going to talk about one axis right here. We talk about this axis here and this axis here. And we have all sorts of different modes of oscillation. So that gives you a clue as to what, what could be pro potentially be a problem there. So this is just showing that this is just the first, uh, first mode in one axis and the third mode in one axis. But we have to start considering in different axes all these different things. So how do we actually absorb low frequency? 
Well, what we have to do, and here's the kicker. This is one of those aha moments. And this is, I guess, the, the final thought. Um, how, we absor how we treat low frequencies. If we can't use, it's impractical for us to use velocity absorption. It just doesn't work. It, well, or it does. You just have to be in the middle of the room. And that does, that does us no good from a, like, a, I guess, aesthetic or functional standpoint. So how do we actually absorb low frequencies at the walls? Well, what we need to do is we need to, do a we need to convert this, 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 what we, we'll call it, it's at a pressure maximum right here. Pressure, we're gonna, we'll call it as potential energy. So potential is when you squish a spring up, potential energy, it means it's stored energy. We need to convert stored energy into kinetic energy, because kinetic energy is velocity. And that's something that we're really good at absorbing with these things here. So that's what panel absorbers do. Panel absorbers turn potential energy into kinetic energy. And so at the wall, this panel, if I have a, a gigantic panel here, it's going to respond to a pressure being pushed on it, just like your eardrum. It responds to pressure being pushed and against it, pushed against it. And then if I throw some damping material behind that, then I can damp that down really well. So that's the kicker. And again, that's the aha moment. You're like, oh, I need, that's why these things don't work. And that's, that's why we use panel absorbers on walls, because panel absorbers convert potential energy to kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is something we can damp out. Potential energy is very difficult for us to actually damp out. So, so panel absorbers and Helmholtz resonators are very good at this sort of thing. The catch is, though, they have to be tuned to that specific room. So when you're looking at Room EQ Wizard and you see this, this the resonance there, that you want to damp that one resonance, you can build a tuned resonator. And so I, I'll urge you to go look online. There's all sorts. In fact, I even think on Room EQ Wizard, they have, they might even have under the tools here, let's see, they have, um, they have some modal simulations for your rooms. They don't on this one. Shoot. I thought it did. But there's all sorts of tool sets that help you tune. So if you want to create a tuned absorber for your room, so you want to tune 60 hertz, 61 hertz, they tell you, go buy this panel that's this thickness and put it this far away from the wall and put this material behind it. Or same thing with the Helmholtz resonator. Helmholtz resonators is, is, is basically a mass spring system, a damped mass spring system that responds to frequency. So you can do the same thing there. Or some of the more uh, emerging technologies that are coming out right now are things like active damping. So basically, you have a subwoofer that actually puts out the opposite phase, and it damps out those, 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 those resonances there. Or another thing that, I, that I'm a big fan of these days is multiple subwoofers. So if, if you're dealing with a satellite subsystem, throwing subwoofers throughout the room will actually phase cancel each other out and damp out those really low frequencies which, with, with, with significant effectiveness. So that's the catch. But the thing is, don't ever buy a low, tu a low frequency tuner from somebody, because it's got to be tuned to that one room. So that's the problem. Whereas foam, you can just go buy broadband absorbers and you're good. But buying a low frequency absorber, it's room specific. And so that's very difficult to do. So um, if, you're a, if you're a DIYer, go for it. You can make all your own stuff for this. There's tons of literature on this stuff. If not, hire somebody else to do it. There's, there's, there's a lot of people. I'll do it. Doug will do it. And some other people will do it. Oh, Doug will design it. I'll build it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So if you're into this kind of stuff, I'm wrapping it up here. Um, oh, shoot. There's actually some black overlay in there. Called the Master Handbook of Acoustics, so I, I've, 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 I've pimped these books a couple times. I think they're really, 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 really amazing reads, especially the top one there, Master Handbook of Acoustics. This will, that book actually changed my life. I will say that. It like, when I started getting into this, it's super, super approachable. The math is totally, totally easy. Um, I mean, I won't say easy. It, it's it's very approachable and it's very, very common sense. It was originally written by um, F. L. Neverest, but it's he's passed away since, and uh, Ken Pullman. Uh, has since picked up the, the torch on that one. And it's, it's, it's an amazing book. You can read it cover to cover numerous times, and you always pull something out of it. Uh, and then this other one, Sound Reproduction by Floyd Tool, Dr. Floyd Tool. Um, amazing, 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 amazing book. It really talks to her. It gets a little bit dragged down in the data, but it's an amazing, amazing book. And then also just Orlex. Uh, or or Orlex. The Orlex makes um, foam and these diffusers and all sorts of stuff. They have a really good site. It's called acoustics101.com. It's, it's a really cool one. I mean, granted, it's a little commercial in that they're trying to sell their own stuff. But I mean, really, what, could, what when we're trying to do treat our rooms, we're trying to treat vibration. So it's vibration management. And so Oralex makes a bunch of different vibration management software. Or, or not software, I'm sorry, uh, materials, both construction and also finishing materials. Um, so with that, so this is me. So Merkel Acoustic Research and Design. So um, I'm uh, basically a custom fabricator, designer, acoustician, consultant kind of guy. So if you want to, please hit me up anytime. Any questions from today, I know I kind of was feeding with the fire hose on this stuff. 
The idea is just to pique your interest on this so that I give you a starting point so that you can start on your own journey down this stuff because it's a, it's a long, long path, but it's so, so gratifying. And it's also one of the best, most effective changes you can make in any of your acoustic listening or critical listening spaces. Um, realizing that and, 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 and taking it from a, a room speaker interaction approach instead of just the speakers will really, really, really make a a gigantic difference in your, in, your, in, your, in your listening environment. So again, Jeff on MerkAcoustics.com. Jeff at House is down. That's my recording studio. So uh, it, you can hit me up there, too, or if you want to come record. Um, uh, and then, that, of course, that's my, that's my cell phone number. Just hit me up anytime. Text, phone, call, email. Uh, I'm on Skype. I guess Skype is Jeff at Houses. I'm always on Skype. So um, with that, um, I know we're 15 minutes over time here, but I think that's why they put me last. Because they come like they're like they know I was going to go over. So um, with that, I guess I'll I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it here. Um, you can you guys can bust out. Have an awesome rest of the day. But I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions if there are any. So thank you so much for having an awesome time.